Hi guys, this is uh, Magic Ninja for DeucesCrack.com. I'm just making the fourth episode in the new Crossfire series, which uh, aims to kind of focus on both the mathematical aspects and the psychological aspects of playing and how to make sure you're not really leaking any money in either area. Uh, with that in mind, a couple of you mentioned last video well, in the last few videos you've kind of asked me what sort of stats I use and how my HUD works, so I guess I'll just start this session uh, by quickly describing what my poker tracker numbers are telling you guys here. Uh, typically when I uh, when I sort of set my stats up, I've recently done this again because I had to install poker tracker, uh, so I guess it's fairly fresh in my mind. Uh, the main statistics I'm using uh, aren't necessarily what would be the most useful statistics. Like if I knew someone's river bet frequency, that sounds like it would be really important because you'd be using it for a big pot. But realistically speaking, that's never going to be a big factor in your decision making process. Like I, 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 I would never use a statistic like that. Uh, so, so the main stats that I'm actually using that affect my play are going to be like how often someone steals the cutoff and how, oh, well, obviously the person's VPIP in general, but actually I'm not even, I don't even pay too much attention to their VPIP in general. Uh, I think more important is, is how often people steal the cutoff and steal the button. Here you can see where I'm wiggling the cursor, wiggle, 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 is uh, on best dude's stat, he... Uh, he has a steel cutoff of zero, a steel button of a hundred. I mean, obviously, we have no sample size on this person, but that's what those two stats are. Uh, I have everything color coded. Uh, I can, I can maybe, um, maybe I'll post in the comments what exactly those color codes mean. If you're kind of like a color person like me, but uh, essentially, those are the two major statistics that inform how I play in terms of three betting the small blind and big blind and I think that's a super important thing to just have like just to be really good at doing like you don't want to have any you you want to have a really solid fundamental strategy based on math for how you play the small blind against people when they raise the button and I stress this like every video just because it's it's something that is so easy to teach but makes such a dramatic difference to how you play post-flop. So, I mean, here I've just raised the button with a fairly standard hand, by the way. I'm going to make a relatively small continuation bet of $27. I think that's going to that's gonna be fine with my entire hand range here. I don't expect him to have medium-sized pairs very often. It just doesn't really seem like... You know, he's either going to call or he's not going to call, in my opinion here. If he check-raised, especially with a small check-raise here, uh, I could see him doing this with an air hand, certainly. But I'm just going to fold for now. Uh, he's from Spain, which is interesting. I don't have a good read on that sort of player. And I, I haven't really played with this player a lot. But for now, I'm just going to check-fold and because the turn situation is often going to be tricky if I float. Uh, I really want a better idea of how he's playing and his how aggressive he is and just just a more general psychological read of how he thinks about the game. Uh, like, is he thinking there, oh, I can get a really cheap steal because he's just going to either fold if he doesn't have anything, or is he thinking like, oh, I'm going to check min raise to get value from my hand. He could be thinking either of those, but if he's check min raising to steal there, that's a significantly more advanced thought process than if he's check min raising get value with a queen, which is kind of a fishy play in my mind. Uh, so that that I'll, I'll really be watching out to see how Varico plays. Uh, I guess to to kind of finish up on the statistics point, my stats here are VPIP, three bet, and continuation bet. Those are just like my general broad preflop stats. Uh, I can sit a continuation betting basically like a preflop stat. I mean, it essentially is. Uh, then the next line is steel cutoff, steel button, and steel small blind. And then the next is three bet, small blind, three bet, big blind. So it's basically like broad stats, then like positional stats, then how people respond to positional stats. Uh, that's 3-bet the small blind against steel, by the way. That's not just 3-bet the small blind. It's, it's how, how often he'll raise against a steel in any of these positions. So, 
you know, how I might use those statistics is like if someone raised 70% on the button, well, you know, I'm obviously going to be uh, three betting the small blind a lot more. Uh, if they raise 55% on the cutoff, I'm going to play the small blind as I would against most people. Uh, I'm going to play the small blind similar to how I would play against most people on the button. You know, it's essentially the same thing. So, so that's just really important, and I'll, I'll leave I'll leave that thought there. Yeah, because I'm kind of flirting with repeating myself here a little too much, but just something to keep in mind that if you don't have really solid yeah, uh, if you don't think about these spots very frequently, you need to be because it's such an easy way to improve your game. Uh, here in the small blind, I'm just going to see how best dudes responds to min raising. It looks like he's playing fairly tight so far, but obviously not a large sample. Uh, against Waterfish, he could easily have Ace Ten or Ace Nine, given that he he's playing a hand. Uh, I've just got a small flush. I think my best play here is to induce a bluff from Ten Jack Queen though, and also get less. Uh, here, once the boat comes on the river, you know, he he could have 10 jack queens still. I'm tempted to make a small value bet since I think he wouldn't check a flush quickly. But, I, you know, I just don't think there's a lot of value in betting here. I think that he could check a small flush and, you know, or, or the nut flush. Uh, so that looked pretty clever, but I just didn't think that there was a lot of value in betting any street. I was checking the turn because I thought the right amount of streets of value to get with the hand was going to be two streets. Uh, I think if three streets go in, one of the streets is going to be negative AV for me. This is kind of like a street-based thinking, uh, a pot control kind of way of thinking about the hand. Uh, I've also noticed that he opened this hand with a min raise in early position. Uh, I, I don't really, like, that's, that's an unusual play to make. Uh, he min raised with uh, King Jack S A three O, you know. So that's that was kinda like a loose passive way to play the hand. Uh my loose passive color is blue. Uh, uh to also repeat the colours I use for that. I'm thinking about re raising this hand because we're uh one fifty BB deep with position, but the player seems fairly tight so far and my hand's just it's not quite good enough. I think with Jack eight nine queen I would re raise that hand. Or like seven eight nine jack I think I'd re raise that. So it's it's a it's a fine line, but I don't think it's quite good enough, especially with the player playing tight. I know we've only got fifteen hands, but in a thin spot we we have to use something. Uh, so Waterfish, we're already starting to get a reasonable read on him. He min he min raised in an early position, and he took a kind of like tricky passive line, uh, tricky passive line with flush, and he took a uh, flush and and he check called and for uh, check my my check thing is K. I use K for check and C for bet, uh, but and K C O O P with flush draw. Okay, so already just that one hand, he min raised in early position with a hand that, from my view, he, you know, is, is pretty loose. I, I wouldn't play that hand personally. Uh, then he check called out of position with a flush draw. Not going to be a good play. Uh, interesting that he made it. And then he took a kind of tricky passive line. So we've, we've already got this, like, real read on this player. This is a reasonably loose open. Uh, I don't think it's crazy loose because we're UTG plus one. UTG would be a loose open. Uh, I'm, I'm opening this every time, to be honest. But if it was a little worse, I would fold it. I certainly wouldn't open four, six, seven jack. So that's that's just... This is on the wire, I guess. Uh, this is about as thin as it gets. But I'm playing this hand, typically. Uh, we flop a big hand here. Against this player, Fred, we don't have a good read on him so far. But he's, he's deep, so we're going to assume that he's... You know, we're not going to make too much out of the VPIP of 67 so far. And we're just going to go with the depth of uh, stack and assume that he's probably a reasonable player. He donks into a small. Uh, I don't really have a range for doing this. Like, personally, I would never make this play, so that's interesting. Uh, I'm just going to move his little stat thing here a bit. Uh, that's kind of getting in my way. Uh, and make it... I think it's it's a compulsory spot to raise here. I think if his donk was 45 or something, I mean, I would still raise that, but there might be a tiny bit of thought for calling, but obviously if he makes a small donk, it's just 
it's a no-brainer. The turn is actually quite interesting. Uh, when when he donks the flop, we put his range as something like Jack ten eight or maybe like Ace Queen ten. But when he calls our raise, we're thinking more like six five seven or maybe Jack ten King or something still. But I think on the turn, it's still a compulsory bet fold here. Uh, I I think one sixty seven is pretty good. Uh, I think that'll charge him to draw with any hands and get value against a hand like Ace-10 of clubs if he donked that. On the river, the only play is to... Well, now, on the river, I was about to say the only play is to check, and I believe that to be the case, but I don't want you to feel that it's... It's like... You know, that value betting here would be crazy or anything. It's just that I expect him to call with ace nine more frequently than ace king on the river. Like, if he calls, it's with a hand like uh, ace king of clubs, you know, that he donk called on the flop. Uh, I, I think that hand finds a fold sometimes, and I feel like ace six that had the clubs or ace nine that had the clubs is more likely to be the hand that I see on the river. So all in all, I'm fairly happy with how we played that hand. Uh, if you look at, well, I think we took the perfect line, actually. I, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, pat on the back ass. <laughs> but uh, here on the, like, what I, what I notice is that he played this hand, uh, which is, is loose. So now we're going to put more credence in the 65 VPIP statistic. He uh, played, play, he plays weak hands out of position, and he was... Uh, Leads, weak, uh, weak draw, small, 24 into 42, that's totally relevant, uh, he led with quite a weak hand, uh, here on the river you could consider a bet, I don't think we're getting paid off by worse often enough, I think that jack, jack 9 or jack, f jack 5, 6 or something is more likely to be the hand this, that we see than queens, uh, when when I say when we see, I mean like after we bet and he calls. Anyway, let's just finish off this train of thought with this player, Fred, because we've already got a very solid read on the player now. Uh, he's he uh he's passive, corely withdraws, and also he plays weak hands out of position. I'm just going to start with the pre-flop note. Uh, he called call the small blind with queen ten of clubs. 3-2 spades, whatever, it's double suited. Uh, so, he may be a, uh, he, he may have some post-flop skills that we're not aware of yet, but so far I've, I've got him as a sort of passive corly uh, player at this point. We'll, we'll see if he's tricky or not later. But that's that's where we're at we're at at the moment. Here uh, we've got the nut flush draw. Well, we've got the nut flush blocker rather, and the straight. I think the only play here is to check. I don't think we're ever getting him to fold a better hand. Uh, if he bets, it's an interesting spot because, well, uh, and now on the river the only play is to check. I think if he bets, I'm going to fold. Uh, that that being because I don't think that he would bet two pair here because that makes a straight. Uh, so fairly straightforward hand there. Uh, I think his line is standard. Uh, here, one, uh, I think it's tempting to fold here with the queen nine six six, but we're we're paying four dollars to win sixteen uh, against a player who's probably going to check a fair amount of flops because we've seen him as being. What I'm saying is we're going to get we're going to get to see four cards fairly frequently, and we're getting we're paying four dollars to win sixteen seventy. So you know we just need no equity. Yeah to call their pre-flop. I'm calling any hand. That's about as bad a hand as you can have, and I called it. So that's something that the anti-games really make you think about. It might look like queen 966 there is a snap fold, but I'm gonna be, uh... Okay, so let's let's do that from the crossfire way of anal analyzing a hand. Okay. Mathematically, $4 to win 1670, you would only need like 20% pot, pot equity if you were getting it all in or whatever. I know that's not a good way to think about the hand, but, you know, four to one is. Uh, mathematically, there's just going to be no hand that's more than a 65% favorite against you or something. 68% favorite. Uh, so the math says, hot and cold, you'd want to call. Okay, but that's not how a hand plays out. You've got to do stuff post-flop, right? My read on this player, I would call here versus everyone, by the way. So let's just start with that. I think the math is dominating enough that you should just be calling that, getting those pot odds. Uh, 
especially when he may be raising larger with better hands, so you're more likely to be against a weaker hand. Here with the queens, I think it's tempting to call, but queens are a very bad hand in re-raised pots, and I think that's a standard fold. Uh, if he was 150 BB deep, I would call. Uh, I think there you're getting enough uh, you're getting enough post flop play with your position, but at that point, I I just don't think that you know 280. What are you going to do post flop there? Uh, you're just going to have to fold too many flops or get it in dominated too frequently. Okay, so here we we already talked about the math. Now let's talk about the uh, psychological and more player specific stuff. Well, we've noticed that he's a loose passive kind of player, so he's going to check a lot of flops. When someone's checking a lot of flops, that's really good because we were going with our hot and cold kind of hand equity. That means we're going to get to see four cards fairly frequently. Uh, on top of that, uh, on top of that four card frequently sort of thing, I personally feel like in these kind of spots, if I was to donk on a board like King Nine Three, I think that would be a good board to donk. You can't really check. Uh, this is kind of an interesting spot here, because if I check the flop, I can't call the turn. But if I bet the flop, I'm essentially bluffing. I think I'm still going to just try to check it down. But, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, if he bets the turn here, I have to fold, and he's going to do that fairly frequently. Still, I think that when someone raise calls the small blind, they hit that flop fairly frequently. Uh, as you can see here, the, I, I read this as being a very strong bet. He may just have ace-5 of hearts or something, like ace-5 of hearts, 4-6, but I, I just don't see it playing out very well. Uh, let's just finish off this little little thought about uh, playing in the blinds against loose opens with extreme pot odds. If the board was king-9-3 and I donked into this player with my queen-9-6-6, six, six, which I think would be a good play, uh, what I would be expecting is just that he would fold here very frequently, uh, and and that's that's obviously gonna or or not. He certainly wouldn't just be like, oh, let's raise that donk with air. I wouldn't expect him to make that play. He may be very capable of that, but nothing I've seen in the the twenty hands <laughs> I've played against him so far would suggest that that's gonna be how the hand plays out. Uh, here we get raised. It's a uh, it's a little smaller than a three x raise, and we're getting pot odds. Yeah. This is kind of a tricky spot because we obviously have reverse implied odds if a diamond comes. Uh, I also, yeah, uh, I, I think you can call here, but I just don't see the hand playing out very well. I think his raising range is any ace x of diamonds and nine seven, and occasionally just some kind of air ball hand like seven king queen jack, but I I don't think that on that board where we're going to be shipping on him with like. We're gonna we're gonna shove on him fairly frequently there. I don't think he's bluff raising that board too frequently, uh, and so I would I would say that he has ace x of diamonds fairly frequently, and that's just gonna ace x of diamonds or like kings with diamonds, something like that. Uh, we're just gonna be so screwed if he has those hands uh, that I think we can fold there. Here. Uh, Okay, so let's let's just uh, I'm gonna raise it to 16 here because of the uh, lot well the antes. I, I usually raise to 12, but I don't know. I, actually, I don't. I, I my my typical raise size in anti games is 16. I like a 12 dollar raise size on the button though. Uh, here, I, I don't have any read on third from the sun. We are 200 BB deep, so I'm gonna start with the min raise and see how he responds to that. If he's not folding to min raises, I might have a different strategy. But uh, I, I like the min raising in the small blind uh, with a reasonable frequency. Uh, here on the left table, the turn looks like a terrible card for us. Uh, I think I'm actually still going to bet it. Uh, it, it. My reasoning uh, here is kind of complicated, so I'm just going to do that. Uh, I think the only play on the right table is check call. Here on the left table, I figure if we check the turn, he's going to bet the river. Uh, I'm quite happy to bet fold here, by the way. Yeah, I think you could have checked on the left table, by the way. Not to be results-oriented, but I think that that decision is close, but I stand by my bet. The reason I bet was because I thought it was quite likely that he had a hand like Queen-Jack-10, which is going to fold, or he had a hand like Ace-X of Hearts, which I heavily weighted in his range. Uh, I think it's very likely that he has Ace-X of Hearts, but uh, I don't think that we can call the river if he 
if we check and then he bats, I think his range is going to be too strong. So even though it looked like a terrible card for us, uh, I went by that. Here, I think that third from the sun, uh, I think he has a reasonable range here, but I think I'm going to fold here. I, I think you could call, but I, uh, I'm not going to. <laughs> and my reasoning there is he re-raised his pre-flop, which makes a hand like Ace-X of Spades more likely than uh, just the nut blocker. And I heavily weight his bet there as being for value as opposed to a bluff. Uh, I think if he was going to bluff, he might bet slightly smaller. Uh, I, I feel that that bet size is more polarizing. Like, if he had a hand such as... 10-5 of spades, I wouldn't expect that bet size, and if he was merely trying to get me to fold a hand like 7-8-9 that floated him out of position, I would expect a bet like 160 or something. That said, people don't play perfectly or rationally necessarily, but I still I still read this bet size as being a fairly polarized bet, so I would expect king x of spades or ace x of spades or the nut blocker or even just a straight bluff. So against that range of hands... I don't think that I'm going to be put into profitable river situations very frequently. Uh, if if he has the nut blocker or a normal bluff just without that sometimes, and he gives up on the river sometimes, but mostly has a good hand, I, I feel like he's going to be in a very good sort of equilibrium point where he's, he's betting with like, like in a very optimal way, which uh, I can't really get into the math here, but just puts you in a bad spot essentially. So I, I just feel like we have to fold here just because it's going to be a difficult river spot. And not just difficult like, oh, I don't know what to do, uh, but it's plus EV. I just mean that we're going to get owned. <laughs> so that's that's why we folded there. Uh, let's, let's just do a quick uh, moment on where we're at here. I'm just going to check screen flow for something. Oh, nope. I don't know how to tell the time, so we'll see how long this goes. But, uh, uh, standard C bet here, by the way, with the Queen 8, 10, 7. On the turn, Fred is a loose passive player, but, uh, we're still going to check here, even though we think that we could probably get him to fold kings at some point. He bets half pot on the river quickly. I read that as, like, ace 3 or ace 6. Uh, ace 6 seems more likely to me. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think we're going to find out, though, because we have to fold. Uh, here on the left table, I, I don't know if this looks like a check to people who play No Limit, uh, or if most people who play PLO kind of understand that this is still a bet, but the uh, reasoning behind this bet here is just that uh, you 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 just can't call on any turn cards. You could call on a 5, but uh, usually if you, if you check, you're going to lose the hand, and C betting should stands to be profitable, betting 24 into 28. So you just bet because you'll lose if you check. Even though it looks like you have showdown value. I mean, you don't. He's usually going to fire the turn, and you can't call. So you ch uh, so you bet. Uh, this, this hand, on the other hand, is different because we've got an overcard. We can call on a queen. We can probably even call on an ace because that would be a polarizing bet from them. So on this, this is the opposite situation. We can call on most turn cards here. Uh, on this turn card, sure, I'm still going to call. Uh, I don't think it's going to play out great if we call here. I mean, he can have pocket aces, or he can have, you know, whatever. On this turn, uh, I expect his range here to be pocket queens, or a hand like 7, 8, 9. I think it's actually better if we bet here and bet something medium size, just as a kind of free showdown bet. We may get check raised by a 10, that's fine, we would have lost $32 on the river anyway, probably. Uh, so, even though, sp it may have been good to notice that Spread Eaton is kind of like a tight player, I would expect him to have aces or kings more frequently there, but uh, I, I think he would usually bet those hands on the turn, maybe not. Uh, still. I, I think I stand by the uh, turn being a bet there. So just really, really, when you're thinking about these boards, whether or not you want to check behind on the flop or bet on the flop, the biggest thing that should be going through your mind is what is going to happen on the turn. You want to be like a chess player, like always thinking, you want, you're almost, like what's going through my head if I was to articulate it would be, it's like a, uh, it's like a tree, like, 
all the possible it's like a possible outcomes tree what what is going to happen on every turn card and so kind of like zooming through my brain is like what will happen on these various turn cards will he bet or will he check and how will i respond to that in on this board texture there aren't really any overcards i'm scared of only the ace and you know I, I might still call on the ace because i would think that he would check an ace sometimes but the ace we may fold that would be a very close spot and i would want a better read on the player uh, on a 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, jack, queen, king, we can call all of those. We might fold a spade versus some people. Uh, that, that would be a kind of interesting card to play on, but there's just no turn card that we're going to fold here, so we can check, and then we can realize our, our equity by calling the turn, and usually they'll check on the river. If they bet, we'll have to make a decision. So that's that's something that should really be going through your mind, that chess thing. Always think, how am I going to respond on the turn? That's that's the biggest thing when thinking about how to play in continuation betting spots. Uh, and to contrast it with that jack, jack, three, four example. Here, yeah, jack, jack, three, four. How are we going to respond if he bets the turn? Like I said, the only card you can call on is a five. And even that's kind of like, well, you're going to call, but you're not super happy about it. Uh, you've got a pretty weak hand. So let's let's just kind of recap where we were at at this table because I I've been paying some attention and I I knew one of the players already so I think we can get a fairly reasonable read of the table here I would I really want to play this hand I'm sure the viewers at home want me to as well but I I don't think it's a profitable call here especially with Spradeaton having a fairly tight three betting range one thing you could do is you could call here because Actually, I think I could justify calling there. I, I think you should fold, but I, I may have called there if I would thought about it longer. And the reason for doing that is because I think that Sprit Eaton's range is going to be very easy to read, and I think Fred is going to be a... Uh, he's just got a weak hand. So one player has a really crappy, trashy hand, and the other player has aces. That's how I would proceed with my thinking. Uh, and so... Post flop on a board texture like this, for example, if I had the 6 8 queen 10 still, I think I would probably lead here. Maybe not lead. I guess 5 4 9 rainbow. That's too good for aces. I don't think I've got any folding equity. But uh, that would be the sort of thought process that I was going through is how would my hand play against aces and how will a bad hand respond there? So just, just some things to think about. Uh, before you instantly do something. But in general, unless your hand is really amazing, you don't want to be cold calling with with uh, that sort of hand. It's, it just doesn't play out well enough, even though it's so pretty. <laughs> uh, here, what a sick call. Okay, yeah, so we, where we were at before that hand went down is we were going to do a quick table recap. Uh, I believe Casp is a pretty strong player. I've actually played with him quite a bit. And, uh, you know... Uh, I, I think he's pretty strong. That's that's enough said. Here, uh, you know, I've been talking about min-raising a lot, but this player doesn't recognize me, so I don't really need a balanced range. He's just sat down. Also, he's shallow, and with this kind of strength of hand, I, I really want to play it. Uh, I want to get as much money in as possible pre-flop so that when I flop a, you know, kings on a 5-4-9 board like the other board, kings there I can just stack off for all the money. Uh, and and be getting my stack in better. So we're artificially shallowing the stacks by making a larger preflop raise size. Here, uh, he's 11, 22 deep, if you can't see that. Uh, I'm certainly going to re-raise him here if he raises. I think this hand will play fairly well in that situation. Uh, we'll call a 4-bet, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to re-buy so that we're a bit deeper. But uh, yeah. Uh, that might be be more interesting. I, I guess the greedy part of me thought there that uh, if we did re-raise the Jack-Jack 10-10, Jack it would be much nicer if we were 200 BB deep against this player. So, uh, Waterfish, we've got the blue tag on. Uh, Casper, I'm going to put him as, you know, we'll call him Red. I think he's a strong player. He's kind of too... Too, uh, too loose to be red, but that's the closest I've got. Spraddleton is, uh, the player notes I usually have is orange for tag that I'm not, like, I was going to say that aren't good, but usually I, I just don't give someone the red tag until I'm like, wow, this player is really great at poker. So, 
If someone has a red tag, for me, that means like very good tag. For orange, it's like unsure or weak. Uh, for blue, loose passive is what I do. You can do whatever you want. But I, I like having the kind of color code. Uh, J-Man, I'm not sure about yet. Uh, th Fred, uh, I, I think we can... I mean, we can basically go with green on Fred, to be honest. I, I feel like blue is kind of just selling ourselves short. I think he's very loose passive. He's been very active so far. Adept, probably going to be orange as well. Uh, these are just kind of players who play very tight, but I don't think that I'll be put into a lot of very difficult situations against them. Uh, unlike someone like, uh, I guess... You know, like lefty or something. He's he's very he. I I think he plays well. He's probably the tightest player that I play with regularly. But he's very tricky post flop, uh, so he would get a red tag. Whereas someone like Spreaderton, I I suspect it's it's unlikely that he's putting all these moves on me. You know, I wouldn't expect that. Uh, third from the sun is probably going to be a uh, you know blue or green tag. He's he's pretty active so far. Uh, Let's see how he played this hand. Okay, so he pots the button. I don't like that play. Uh, so that's that's telling for me. He may just he he may be betting bigger in most situations. Like in the other situation, he bet big, and we said that that meant his range was fairly polarized. But he may just like big bet sizes. Uh, he checked this board uh, with air. I I think he had air. At the end of the hand, uh, and then he checks. He checked again. Check, check. Okay, so I I don't like how he played this hand. Uh, he checked back. T four O on five five seven R. I think that's a very weak play, and the reasoning for that again. Uh, here we have four cards over ten. I think this is a compulsory re-raise against someone that's not playing ten percent under the gun. Uh, yeah, it's not really necessary to look there, but uh, here. You could check this board because, you know, whatever. No, I'm not even going to say that. Um, don't get that in your head. This is a very clear bet. Uh, I, that's, you know, I, I don't think that that really requires too much explanation. I, I think if you had a hand like ace of hearts alone, maybe you could consider something. Uh, but you just want to be getting as much money in as possible here. Uh, I, I probably bet a little more than I normally do, which is kind of a bit exploitable, but that's just because... Uh, my my hand is very flop heavy, and if he folded, it wouldn't be the end of the world, you know. Uh, I I do have a a draw, even though I have so much equity. Uh, here on the turn, I'm gonna make a like very dangerous for him bet size that uh that kind of like threatens his stack for a relatively cheap price. I think 217 is the right number here. This will make him pay when he has kings. That's that's I'm still I'm getting a bit of equity in there against kings. I think you'll call that hand, and uh, you know it threatens him. Uh, what I'm thinking about now is like why I didn't check there. I'm not saying that I think that's the best play. I'm trying to work out a way to describe why that is. I would just say straight up value is the answer there. I think king nine is always calling on the turn, and I think pocket kings are calling on the turn. I also think, despite the fact that we have the two main uh, other large flush draw cards blocked, I still think if he has a small flush, the best line is betting the turn. Uh, he'll be in a very tough spot there if we bet. If he has five six of hearts and we bet the turn, you know. The pot size is going to be like $750 on the river, and we're going to bet 400 into it. He's going to be in a very tough spot there with a small flush, so I think that we stand to stack that hand fairly frequently. And, uh, yeah, that, that'll that that'll play out well for us, I think. Uh, the, the advantage to checking, of course, is that we would induce a bluff from a hand like just lone jack 10 or 8 queen jack or something like that. Uh, sorry, normally here I would have raised on the button. Even though the blinds are loose, I think they're fairly weak players. Uh, I'm not sure about Sky Raider yet, sorry. I, we we don't want to go too far with him, but we're deep and uh, I don't think that that'll play too badly. Here, uh, player isolating someone that's limping. You can't really read too much into this. Uh, I imagine Casper, who plays a lot of heads up, I think. Uh, he's probably got a fairly wide range. Here is a compulsory lead. Uh, that's the only play. Uh, I'm just thinking about how I'll respond if WC shoves on us. Uh, I think we probably just have to get it in here with a full wrap. Uh, 
Oh, well, the play here is now to now to call and fold on turn. Well, okay, a lot of people here might just shove. That's There's no logic behind that. The best play, if you were going to shove, would be to call. And Okay, now, now this is interesting, because Casper has... Probably has queens. Uh, I would expect to see queens here very frequently. Or aces with spades. Uh, I'm thinking about our three-way equity with this hand. I'm, I'm, you know, it's... I should probably know this, but... If we call, we can fold a turn, spade, or a pair. Uh, I think we probably should be getting it in here still. We've probably got 33% equity multi-way. I don't think anyone else has the straight draw. And, uh... I think it's very likely. And here on this turn card, I, we may as well just check. I think Casper's going to bet this card 100% of the time. But, uh, you know. Uh, and we suck out like a genius. So th those were the ranges we pretty much expected to see here. So uh, I don't know how to get the equity with uh, Poker Tracker. Sorry, guys. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll check that one out in Holder Manager or Poker tracker after. Uh, okay, so this spot, this spot here is really important. Uh, if this guy had a steel button of 85 or 100 or something, and we had a good read, we might 3-bet that hand. But against someone that's not raising the button a lot, that play would be very poor. Uh, the hand is too weak. So that, uh, playing with a hand like ace, big, big, small without a suited ace against the button is really a product of how often they steal. So here our stats have updated and we've got his small blind steal as 33. Uh, his button steal is 33, sorry. We certainly wouldn't be 3-betting that hand against a button steal of 33. So that's that's just really important uh, to keep in mind. On the other hand, Casper so far is 75, and I have no reason to believe that his actual button steal is less than that. He's a heads-up player. Uh, He's, he's pretty tricky. That, that seems reasonable. So here, we're obviously going to re-raise this hand. I think you should be re-raising this until someone's button steal is like 15. But uh, just things to keep in mind for if your hand is weaker than this. You know, uh, Here, we're just going to make a three-quarter pot continuation bet. Uh, it looks like a spot where you could conceivably check. I don't think that's the best play. Uh, if we got shoved on here, interesting, because Casper would have to have, you know... Wow, this is an interesting spot. He just lost a large hand. I, c I would expect to see nines here with a reasonable frequency. We do have 10 outs versus that hand. Uh, I, I think that we see a hand like ace-queen-10 here often enough. Uh, or jack-queen-10. Uh, this is a very tough spot. I think our range, we have aces or ace-jack a lot. Uh, I, you know what, I don't think we have 45% equity here against his range, and I think if we get all the money in, we need that. Wow, this is a crazy fold if I fold. I'm going to fold. I, I, uh, I'm not positive about that one. That's that's very tricky. Obviously, if we had 100 BB, I'm getting it in there. It's it's a product of our... The depth of our stacks makes it very tricky. Yeah. Here, I'm just going to make a little small bet here. Yeah. Against a weak player here, we're paying six dollars to win eleven or to win nine. Sorry, I just I think getting we're getting a very good price on min raising any hand against a weak player there. So I'm going to do that. You notice my small bet out here with the three five is just to get hands like either get value or to get them to fold. Yeah, I'm going to make another small bet on the turn. Well, we didn't get raised. I'm going to check. Uh, I think you could bet the turn to get a bit of value from jacks, but I think that's not going to bet if we check. Uh, I think checking is fine. I do. I, I think he had a better flush here. I, I would expect Typhoon to show up with King X of Diamonds or Queen uh, Ace X of Diamonds here, even though he didn't raise. He seems kind of passive. Uh, not passive, but uh, loose. I don't, I don't know if that was a good train of thought, but I think the play is to fold the turn. I'm not really willing to put much action in with that hand in that situation. Uh, this spot against Casper is very tough. Uh, if we had Ace Queen Ten, like Ace Queen Ten Five, a hand would actually be. Well, the five doesn't really help us, but the queens just aren't that good. I guess if we have Ace Queen Ten here, that's what we've essentially got, right? And uh, I just feel like for him to shove on this board texture 
he either needs jacks. I just, I don't, what I don't understand is that he's shoving. I, I don't think I would raise a hand on this board if I was Casper. Like, I don't have a raising range. Uh, if, if I raised this board, I, I honestly don't understand what he's raising with here. Uh, like, if he has jack, queen, ten, or jack, king, ten, obviously the players to call. Uh, if he has just the big rap, like queen, king, ten, eight, I mean, actually he could raise that. Queen, king, ten, eight would be okay. That would be a reasonable raise. Uh, if he had that, like, that's the only hand I can imagine wanting to raise there. Uh, if he had ace, king, queen, I guess he might raise that or something, but that hand has us beat. Uh, if he had nines, I can see raising that, just so that the scare card doesn't come, and it's going to be very difficult for me to fold a hand like ace jack or ace queen king, which I could certainly have. Uh, so nines would make some sense. So against those kind of hands, we should be folding. Uh, and I, I stand by our fold, but if someone posted a little response in the form of some like math against a range, uh, I could I could imagine being the the play being getted in there as well. So. Who knows, but I, I suspect strongly that that was a fold. Just because his range is so nines and uh, nines heavy. Nines and jacks, and, you know, ace, queen, king, maybe? Like I said, I'm just not really sure what he has there. Uh, anyway, before I hop on too long about a hand that's relatively insignificant, let's see what's been going down. Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, this this last hand, uh, Fred showing that he is is very loose. Uh, he raised in position with a pot sized raise here, and I think he had three four in his hand. Let's just skip to the end of the hand so we see. Okay, so it's very interesting to get a to get a better read on the player and start thinking about how he considers the game. Uh, let's let's look at what he did on the uh, flop here. Actually, both these players made very interesting plays. Typhoon. Uh, uh, th these are both uh, I d both these plays you would never see in a high stakes game, so it's quite interesting. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna call him Green. Uh, so Typhoon bet twelve dollars into forty eight dollars with Queens. So we know we know how he thinks about the game now. He wants to get he wants to get paid. He wants to get paid small. small rather than okay right so like why this note is important and how you should be you're really trying to get into players heads like that's the game right so when he bets 12 into 48 right this is a relatively small and insignificant pot but I might be thinking on the river if he bets half the pot in a situation where I think he has like nuts uh, where I think he has the nuts but I'm like oh he would never bet half the pot with the nuts here that would be an irrational play because he should be betting three quarters of the pot, so therefore he can't have the nuts. This player, I would expect to bet half the pot on the river with the nuts. Here on the left table, queens is normally a fold if you're 100 BB deep. We talked about that earlier. But this stack size, certainly happy doing that. Uh, when he checks this board, I think he's going to call me a lot. But if we check back, uh, I think he's going to win the pot somehow. We can't call on many turn cards. And I also don't think that at 200 BB deep, I'm getting check raised all in here. Unless he has the knots. I, I wouldn't expect him to play it that way, though. Uh, so I just don't think we're getting check raised here very frequently. Uh, 100 BB deep, I might check this flop. Because I would expect to check raise much more frequently. However, Casper is very tricky. And uh, we fold. I'm like, happy with how we played that hand, though. Uh... Here we raise the 5789 just to gain some post flop momentum. I'm just going to bet 67 here. I think that both these players, uh, they're just going to fold if they don't have something, and they're never going to fold if they do. So, uh, fairly dry board. Can bet a little over half the pot. Uh, here, just bet to take it down. Uh, so, this Typhoon hand, then. Okay, Fred, clear fold there, by the way, guys. Not going to consider anything silly. Uh, here we've got the pair in the uh, pair in the gut shot here. I'm tempted to bet, but I think that if he has anything that would fold to my bet, he's going to... Uh, he, if he has anything that would fold to my bet, he's going to check. So the advantage of betting, you know, it, it's not as big an advantage. We're going to get to realize our equity when he has a hand like King, Jack, 10, regardless. Uh, 
I'm still going to keep seeing how this player responds if I just min-raise every small blind. Uh, I, I think I get to play 100% of hands against this player, basically, because he's going to be fairly passive post-flop. Uh, here I'm just going to keep betting. I'm going to bet fairly large, because I expect a hand like Jack, King of Hearts, will call any sized bet. Ace-Jack is never folding from this player. Uh, and, you know, obviously I want to make sure that I get all the money versus... Well, not all the money, but as much as possible versus 7-8 or... Queen 8 or Queen, you know, those are the two big ones. Uh, anyway, let's, like, I just want to tie off this Typhoon hand because someone mentioned in the last video, uh, which I which I enjoyed, uh, they mentioned that I was using, like, a micro read to establish bigger reads later. And this is something that great players are really good at doing, is, like, you see something small, but that, that could be used for something big. Like, a lot of people will be like, oh, I wish I had a better read on Typhoon and how he played the river if we were in a big river spot against him. But look, this is this is a ton of information on how this player thinks about the game. He bets small, and then he called the flop raise, and then on the turn he checks, check, check, and then on the river he bets small to get paid off, and kind of as a, like, blocking bet or something. Yeah, uh, that just tells you everything you need to know about this player. Uh, it's it's super important. Uh, also, Fred, he raised really big with 3-4 on this board because it was a vulnerable hand. He raised large with a vulnerable hand. So these players both played their hand in very, like, transparent ways. Uh, I actually kind of like Fred's line with the, ch the turn check there, like, raise big and turn check, but, uh, you know, obviously not a very, uh, you know, he's playing this hand in position. It's not very advanced play to play that hand there. So, well, it's just loose and bad. Uh, so, you know, this one hand just tells you more about these two players than seeing, you know, a thousand hands with a few numbers. Uh, just, just very important to pay attention at the table, is essentially what I'm saying. Anyway, I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, please ask as many questions as you want in the comments, and I'll get to as many as I can. And uh, tune in next week for Crossfire with, uh, with Magic Ninja.